So 2-124 gives us a conical frustum that is partially submerged in a liquid. I think we are told that the liquid is water. Yes, the liquid is water under standard engineering conditions. So our conical frustum is partially submerged. So I'm going to try to draw it here, which means that a portion of the frustum is underwater. A portion of the frustum is above water. We're given a couple of dimensions to determine the geometry of this frustum. We're told that the smaller radius is three feet. And we are told that the larger radius is six feet. Okay. We're also given the total height of the frustum, which is nine feet. Nine feet is just a height measurement, so measured from the bottom to the top of the frustum, not diagonally, but height from the bottom. And then we are given or we are, I, we are given the height of the frustum above the water surface as H. The problem identifies it as H. Now the problem says, determine the height at which this oak block will float above the water surface. And we're told that the specific weight of this object, so the specific weight of this oak wood is 48 pounds per cubic feet. Now we need to use what we already know from fluids. This is water under standard engineering conditions. What is the specific weight of the fluid? Of water? 62.4 yep. pounds. <clears throat> Appreciate it, the 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. I don't like this subscript W, so I'm just gonna call it um, block. Because I look at W and I think water. So I'm just going to call it the specific weight of the block, 48 pounds per cubic feet. So this is a fun, fun uh, problem. Okay. And we're going to have to solve it by going back to our geometry, but also by applying a little bit of our knowledge of fluids. So let's think of the following. If this oak block is floating, that means that our forces are in equilibrium. And what forces can you identify acting on this oak block? There are two main forces that we're going to consider today. What are they? Uh, weight. Okay, so we have the weight of the block. I'm just going to draw a little line here. F, W, and what other force is acting on this block? Buoyancy. Buoyancy, right? So buoyant force pushes my block upward. My weight pulls my block downward. Now, if this block is floating, that means that there is a balance between these two forces. In other words, if I were to go back to my statics and do a force balance, sum of forces in the y direction, I'm going to call this vertical axis the y axis, just for now. Sum of forces in the y direction, I get that I have a buoyant force pushing upward, that's positive, and the weight of the block pulling downward, that's negative, and if this is a system in equilibrium, the sum of forces equals zero, which you learned in your statics class. So what does this give me? This means that I can now express my buoyant force as being equal to the weight of the block. Oops, buoyant force, here we go. As being equal to the weight of the block. And now, if I can figure out what the weight of the block is, then I can figure out what the buoyant force is. And you may be wondering, why is that helpful for me? So remember one thing. In week number three, we defined our buoyant force as equal to the specific weight of the fluid times the submerged volume of the object. And why is that important? The buoyant force that's pushing this block upward 
is equal to the specific weight of the fluid, that is water, multiplied by this submerged volume of my block. So if I know the buoyant force, then I can find this volume. And if I can find this volume, then I can find the depth H that the block is above my fluid. So it's a fun, fun problem. I, I, I think we're going to have fun solving it. At least I will. But first, we need to go back to a bit of our geometry. So we know that our buoyant force is equal to our weight. I'm going to rewrite that expression up here. And we know that our buoyant force is equal to the specific weight of my fluid. And my fluid is simply water multiplied by my submerged volume. I'm just going to call the submerged volume V sub for submerged. Now, this is equal to my weight. And I don't really have the mass, so I can't really calculate the weight. But remember that we define the specific weight as equal to an object's volume, or weight, divided by its volume. And based on this definition, we can solve for an object's weight by simply multiplying the specific weight of the object times its volume. So now that I have this relationship, I know that the weight of my block will be equal to the specific weight of the block multiplied by the volume of the block. Now, from here moving forward, you are done with your fluids. Everything else moving forward is geometry. So let's try to figure it out. What is, right, and this may be a tricky question, but what do you think is the volume, right, of a conical frustum? And if you don't remember this from geometry, there's two things you can do. You can try to visualize this as a cone for which you're going to have to determine the total height and then find the, some sort of factor of proportionality, but that may be a little bit hard. So what I'm going to do is, if you don't remember your geometrical relationships, you can always look them up. These are typically easily found online. So can somebody give me an expression for the volume of a conical frustrum based on my two radii and my height? You can find it online if you want. You can just... Give it to me, or uh, whatever. Volume is equal to h over 3 pi r squared, if I'm correct. Which r? There are two radii. Uh, honestly, this is where I got confused. I would only use just a small cap, uh, lowercase r. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's OK. That, that's perfectly fine. So let's. Um, so let's look at that. So you mentioned the volume was equal to h over 3 pi r squared. Now that is actually the volume of a cone, OK? So this is the volume of a cone. So a cone, if this were a cone, it would look like this, OK? And that's why you only need one r value. Now this is kind of like a cone but not really, right? We have the volume of this cone minus the volume of this imaginary part. So there's two ways we can solve it, right? We can use geometry to figure out what this hypothetical height would have been, and then find the volume of my hypothetical cone, and then subtract from it the volume of this little cone. So that's one way of solving it. Another way is to try to find the volume of a conical frustum directly, OK? So either way, we're going to get uh, the same relationship. So the volume of a conical frustum, it's a pretty complicated equation, but it basically comes from this cone equation. Now, I don't remember if I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to give you the correct value or not, so you may want to check this online and confirm if my value is correct. But I think, if I remember correctly, the volume of a conical frustrum is actually related to this number. It would be h over 3 times pi. So the constant is remain, remains the same. Times, and here's where we're going to aim, we're going to start to consider our different radii. I think it's going to be times 1 radius squared 
plus another radius squared plus the product of our two radii. Can somebody confirm if this is the correct equation for the volume of a conical frustum? Yeah? Okay. That's right. That's right. At some point, I'll have it completely memorized because this is a problem that students always want to go over with before the exam. And it's, it's good that you do. We have our geometry here. And now that we have our geometry set up, you'll notice that this is no longer a fluids problem. It is a geometry problem. So if I would take this equation and I would like to write down all my values, I get my specific weight of water that is 62.4. I'm going to leave the units out to prevent this from getting messy, but you can always write your units when you solve the problem, but I have 62.4 multiplied by the submerged volume. So the submerged volume is a conical frustum that only consists on this part. So let's write the equation for the volume. I have H over three. First of all, for my submerged volume, I have, I'm just gonna call this H prime, a submerged H. And what do we know about this H? What is it equal to in terms of the whole cone? Nine minus H. Yep, so I have nine minus H divided by three, multiplied by pi, and then here I can start multiplying my radii, R1. But look at this. I'm not really sure what this R1 is. But what do I know about this R1 radius? Notice that our radius starts at three and then increases linearly until it gets to six. So that means that our radius here at the surface should have some sort of linear proportion between my three and my six. Can somebody find or express R1 as a function of three, six, and H prime or nine minus H? Uh, you could do like three over six times H. Okay. Like that. Yeah, if it, if it gets too confusing to look at this frustrum, I would recommend that you, instead of looking at this frustrum, look at a section at a triangular section of this frustrum, okay? So we have, what looks like a triangular section, so that's from the frustrum all the way to the top of the cone. And we have the top of our frustrum, a distance of three, at the bottom of our frustrum, a distance of six, and here, somewhere in the surface, an unknown R prime. So now, given this information and knowing that the distance between three and six is nine, and this distance is H, do you think we can find or use similar triangles to find an expression? I think we can. And I think we may actually end up with an expression very similar, if not identical, to what Jed had given us. So Jed, what was, um, what was your expression? Uh, it was three over six H. So three divided by six H. Correct. Okay. So you're saying that your R prime will be equal to three over six H or simply 0.5 H. Now let's prove if this is true, okay? Because we need to be kind of careful, Jed, here. If H is zero, that means that my radius is at the top. But notice that when H is zero, R prime should be three. If the whole block is submerged, R prime should be three. So I'm, I think we need to do a little bit of more uh, moving around with this expression. Let's see what happens when H, when H is nine. If H is nine, then my R prime is 4.5. But here, for an H of nine, we should get an R prime of six. So we do need to probably come up with a different relationship, Jed, if that's okay with you. Can somebody else try to come up with a geometrical relationship for this? Let's think, we have what's essentially a linear equation, and we know that when h is zero, r prime when h equals zero is equal to three, r prime when h equals nine is equal to six. So we have two points in a linear equation, two coordinates, zero, three, nine, six. If you have two points along a line, can you find the equation for that line? I think you can, right? Yeah. 
Okay, so let's find the equation for the line. We have a linear equation, y equals mx plus b. Let's find the slope first. So what is the slope? The slope is the difference in y minus the difference in x. In other words, 6 minus 3, that's 3, minus the difference in x, 9 minus 0, that's 9. So that is the slope. But then we have an initial value, right? When h equals 0, r has to equal 3. So I could be wrong here, right? Because it's been a while since I've done geometry, but let me try. And by the way, this video is gonna cancel out again because we're running out of time. So if you like, once it closes, just sign in again.